Hi spoilers! Welcome back to the Spoiled Librarians where we recap and ruin books that you don't have time to read right now. Today we're gonna talk about The Wicked King, our sequel in the Folk of the Air trilogy by the indomitable Holly Black and probably one of my favorite sequels in the entire YA category. The story starts off with Jude's childhood, just like the Cruel Prince did. In the first book, we saw her parents get murdered. In this one, we see Jude and Taryn receiving some martial education at the hands of Madoc. This prologue does a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to Jude's character building and her relationships with her sister Taryn and her adopted father Madoc, for lack of a better term. This prologue contains what has to be one of the most famous quotes from the Folk of the Air trilogy. You must be strong enough to strike and strike and strike again without tiring. The first lesson is to make yourself strong. This is something that Maddox says to Jude and Taryn when it comes to the strategy of winning not just a battle, but a war, and it informs almost everything that Jude does in Elfheim. Because, following this quote, it doesn't matter what happens throughout the war as long as you are the one left standing at the end of it. Maddox's lesson in this prologue also foreshadows the rest of the book, if not the trilogy itself, because he talks about how it's easy to take something when no one else is looking. It's quite a bit harder to defend it, even when the odds are on your side. We know that Jude foiled Maddox's plans in The Cruel Prince, and now she is up against the man who taught her everything she knows about political strategy. So this prologue serves a little bit as a recap for The Cruel Prince and as setup for The Wicked King. This is your last chance to exit the video before we start spoiling things that actually matter to the plot of the story, so be careful, here there be spoilers. After the prologue, we jump five months past the end of The Cruel Prince. We are five months into the reign of Cardin as High King of Elfheim, as well as five months into his submission to Jude for one year and a day. Cardin and Jude despise each other, or so they keep saying. The story opens with them in the throne room slash banquet hall slash ballroom with Cardin giving audiences as High King. Jude sees her sister Taryn dancing with Locke. In the five months since the book ended, they still haven't spoken to each other. Cardin is granting audiences to all of his folk at court, which is a tricky time for Jude because nobody knows that she has Cardin under her thumb, which means that she can't can't do anything to give that away. One of the fairies who comes to petition Cardin for clemency is named Grimson. He is a smith of legendary power. He's the one who created the blood crown that created all of the drama in the first book. And he was also banished by King Eldred. So he's come to ask Cardin for clemency. He doesn't want to be exiled from Elfheim anymore, and he's willing to craft incredible magical materials for Cardin. Jude has less faith. She's pretty sure that Grimson is playing with words when he says, my loyalty will be as great as your wisdom. However, Cardin grants the pardon before Jude can do anything to stop him. The other important petitioner is Locke. Jude might still be attracted to him physically, but his manipulation and betrayal have ruined any chance that she's going to be attracted to Locke mentally. Locke asks Cardin to make him the new master of revels. Locke is too suspicious of Jude and her relationship with Cardin for Jude to risk saying anything. So she's forced to accept when Cardin says yes. Towards the end of Cardin's audiences, Jude intercepts a note from Balkin that was on its way to Cardin. Balkin has sent numerous notes since he's been imprisoned, and Jude has intercepted all of them with the help of the Court of Shadows. At this point, it's revealed to the reader just how isolated Jude has become in her life at the palace. Almost everyone that Jude has trusted has left her. Taryn chose Locke over her relationship with Jude. Jude betrayed Madoc in The Cruel Prince. Vivi and Oak are in the mortal world. Jude might have control of Cardin, but she certainly doesn't have his loyalty, which means that the only people she can trust are the Court of Shadows, which is made up of Ghost, Roach, and bomb. So it's Jude who goes to visit Baelkin instead. Not a surprise, he refuses to tell Jude anything he would have told Cardin. So, on her way out of the prison, Jude takes a guard named Volsiber captive. Jude wants Volsiber to tell her what was in Baelkin's message, but of course, Volsiber doesn't know either. However, he does know about other messages that Baelkin's been sending. Prince Baelkin has been communicating with the Queen of the Undersea, Orla. Orla is planning to use the information she gets from Baelkin to ruin Cardin. Jude is surprised by this, since Orla Orla's daughter Nicasia is part of Cardin's inner circle. When Jude returns to the palace, because obviously living with Madoc is no longer an option, she finds Taryn waiting for her in her room. There is nothing resembling an apology, but Taryn wants them to be on speaking terms again and for Jude to come to her wedding. So, tired of fighting with her twin sister, Jude says yes. If you were wondering, Jude is still poisoning herself with tiny bits of fairy fruits and vegetables so that she can continue her immunity. That turns out to be a good thing because life at court is 
is dangerous, as Jude is reminded of once again when Ghost brings her to Cardin's room. The room is totally trashed. Cardin shows her the two arrows that were shot into his bed, apparently while he was in it. Cardin can't describe anything about the assassin except that they faded into the wall after the incident. Jude and Cardin examine the room and discover a secret passage. Jude goes through alone and discovers the former king's chambers on the other side. And in those rooms is Nicasia. Nicasia went to surprise Cardin in his rooms and saw him with another girl. Overcome with jealousy, she used a convenient crossbow and fired at the girl who was in bed with Cardin. Immediately, Jude thinks that this was Baelkin and the Queen of the Undersea's plan, but Nicasia is quick to reassure her, no. Jude tells Nicasia she's going to be executed for her crime of an almost attempted assassination unless she agrees to Jude's terms. Jude wants to know what the girl's mother is planning for Cardin, and Nicasia says, obviously, the Queen of the Undersea wants her daughter to marry Cardin and rule over Elfheim. If Cardin says no, Queen Orlok is going to use her water powers to drag Elfheim into the sea. Nicasia also reveals that someone Jude trusts has already betrayed her. Now, wait a second, we just did this. How many people does Jude trust? Three. Just the Court of Shadows. Jude brings Cardin to her room. It's the only place in the palace where she's sure he'll be safe. And Cardin asks for her to kiss him. This will be their second kiss. I blew right past the first one in The Cruel Prince. Sorry. Cardin is tied to a chair and Jude is trying to figure out whether or not Cardin actually likes her or is just trying to play a trick on her. And it both wasn't relevant to the plot, but mostly I forgot. In The Wicked King, Jude hates that she wants to kiss Cardin again. And and she vividly remembers Cardin saying that he hates how much he wants her. There's a council meeting and Maddock pulls Jude aside at the end of it. Jude spent the whole meeting trying unsuccessfully to get the council to take the Queen of the Undersea's threat seriously. Maddock says he still cares about Jude, even though she poisoned him. Honestly, you'd think he'd be a little bit proud of her. Jude searches the former king's rooms with the help of Baum, one of our illustrious Court of Shadows members. We learn that Taryn posed as Jude in order to get a key to Jude's rooms and is lying there in wait when Jude comes back from installing Cardin in the king's suite. Taryn brought all of her sister's old clothes and jewels as well as sketches for new outfits, and it's a bribe essentially. Taryn does not want Locke to be the new master of Revels, and she wants Jude to make sure it doesn't happen. Now, Jude doesn't want that either, but she can't risk Locke being more suspicious of her and Cardin's relationship than he already is, but she lies to her sister and says that yes, she'll take care of it. Jude heads back to the throne room and is immediately pulled aside by Cardin. Jude takes a moment to appreciate how the realm is responding to Cardin as king, right? Not just the folk of court, but also the land and nature itself itself are all responding to having a young, vibrant king on the throne. She also notices that he's wearing her ring on his finger. Jude realizes Cardin stole it right off her finger when he grasped her hand earlier that day. Cardin pulls Jude aside and assures her that he's made sure Taryn will not be in the room for whatever spectacle Locke has created tonight, which is not exactly reassuring to the reader. Jude hates how much Cardin is affecting her. She's got all of those butterfly, warm, fuzzy feelings that you get from a love interest that you supposedly hate. And in the center of the room, Locke makes an announcement. Tonight, the court is going to crown a new queen of mirth, typically a mortal girl that they select to get drunk, glamour, and spend the night humiliating. Of course, Luke picks the only mortal girl in court. Jude. It goes about as well as you could expect. Jude is furious and humiliated and full of secrets that she's not willing to reveal just because Locke has her over a barrel here. So she puts up with everything they do to her. And at the end of the spectacle, the Queen of Mirth and the King of Elfheim have to dance together. Jude and Cardin fit together perfectly, and they're both a little upset by how much they enjoy the dance. When Jude finally manages to leave the ballroom, she sees creatures coming up from the shore. The Queen of the Undersea has sent messengers. They announce their message not to Cardin, but to the whole of the court. Queen Orlach wants to unite their kingdoms by marrying her daughter Nicasia to Cardin. Her announcement also gives gives them three chances to accept before there are consequences. Cardin hears the messengers out and then invites them to the revel. He pulls Jude aside and asks her to gather his council together. Before this emergency council meeting, Maddock tries once again to get Jude onto his side. He says that the undersea queen has managed to conquer all of the smaller sea kingdoms and she is the only kingdom left standing. She plans to do the same thing once she puts her daughter on the throne of Elfheim. After everyone at the council table has given
given their opinion, Madoc asks Jude for hers. She reveals that Prince Balkin has been in contact with the Queen of the Undersea and she has been intercepting messages. Cardin sends Jude to go find Nicasia and bring her to the council. On top of being named Queen of Mirth tonight and humiliated in front of the whole court, now Cardin is ordering her around too and she is furious when she goes to fetch Nicasia. When Nicasia approaches Cardin, he gives her his own message for the Queen of the Undersea. The next time she threatens Elfheim, her daughter will become his prisoner. Nicasia urges him to consider her mother's offer of marriage because they would make a very strong alliance, but eventually has to leave the room. Cardin kicks out everyone on the council except for Jude, but when they're finally alone, before he can say anything, Jude tells him that if he ever gives her an order again, she will humiliate him in front of everyone. And then she walks out on him too. Taryn's wedding is swiftly approaching and Jude is nervous about having Oak back in Elfheim. She decides to use a prisoner to send false information about Oak to Balkin. At the next council meeting, Madoc wants to use Oak to draw Orlog out of hiding and into a direct conflict, but Jude refuses to let this happen. When the council is leaving the chambers, another member stops Jude and reminds her that as the king's right hand, she could fire Madoc from the council and hire herself a new general. This advice seems almost useful, but knowing fairies, Jude thinks that it's also a trap. Cardin summons Jude because he has a message from Balkin. With the arrival of this message, Cardin is concerned about how much Jude has done that he's unaware of. Yeah, that's fair. Cardin asks Jude what he should do. Jude says to have Balkin brought into the throne room in chains and to see what he wants. Jude asks Cardin to seduce Nicasia for more information, and Cardin honestly can't believe that she would suggest such a thing. He, uh, practices his seduction technique on Jude, and we have a really well-written sex scene. Not closed door. Jude thinks about how, out of all of the truly terrible things Cardin has done, making her like him is the absolute worst. As far as sex scenes go, this one is tense and romantic, and like much of their relationship, a constant fight for dominance. It was really good and a strong addition to their relationship arc. To distract herself from thoughts of Cardin and everything that happened, the next day Jude works as a spy rather than an advisor. She hunts down Locke and threatens him. As Master of Revels, Locke can make Cardin lose face and favor with his court. As an aside, she also threatens him if he ever hurts her sister. And now it's almost time for the wedding, so Jude and Roach, our favorite member of the Court of Shadows, travel to the mortal world to pick up Oak and Vivi. When they arrive, they re realize that Vivi has told her girlfriend Heather absolutely nothing about the fairy world. Heather thinks they're going to a perfectly normal wedding off the coast of Maine. Vivi waits until quite literally the last minute before they hoist Heather on top of a magical horse to carry her across the water before she admits that she is a fairy. And by the way, they're going to the fairy realm of Elfheim. Heather is a little awestruck, but accepts it. Maybe a little too fast. Once they arrive at Maddox's house, it's Jude who pulls Heather aside and tries to prepare her for what's about to happen. She tells Heather the rules she needs to follow if she wants to keep out of trouble. She gives Heather salt and she gives Heather rowan berries to carry with her. When she finally gets back to the castle, she sees Cardin and Nicasia together and she is eaten with jealousy even though this was entirely her idea. Jude goes to visit the smith Grimson to get a wedding gift for Taryn. Jude trades one tear for a pair of earrings that will magnify Taryn's beauty. While it eats at Jude's ego, she recognizes that this is the perfect gift to help mend fences with Taryn. Jude goes to the Court of Shadows to finalize her plans to keep Oak safe during Taryn's wedding. Cardin arrives to bring her the news he gathered from Nicasia after just a few kisses. He makes it very clear, just a few kisses. Her mother plans to act during the wedding. Before Cardin leaves the meeting, he tries to bring up what happened between him and Jude, but Jude cuts him off and says they both got it out of their system, which is not the answer that Cardin wanted. Jude goes to Madoc and tells him she wants to work together so that they can ensure Oak's safety now that he's back in Elfheim. Jude tells Madoc what she knows about Orla's plans from Nicasia, that Orla plans to strike during the wedding. Madoc and Jude set three traps hoping to lure them from shore as well as stop them before they actually get to the wedding. Taryn wants to spend the night before her wedding with her sisters and while Jude is on her way to this little bachelorette party, she is attacked and shot in the thigh with an arrow. Jude manages to escape, but her horse is killed and she leaves all of her belongings behind, including Taryn's presents.
present and the dress she was supposed to wear to the wedding. Jude finds Cardin very shortly after she arrives at the wedding and she's worried that she is falling in love with him. She wonders what that will do to her ambitions, what she's going to do about him. She also decides that what she really needs to do is kill Cardin before she falls in love with him completely. Which sounds, yeah, like a terrible plan. Jude orders Cardin to never be alone tonight, even though the implications of that make her uneasy. She doesn't want to call it jealous. Jude wasn't very careful and Maddox overheard their exchange, which means her adopted father now knows that Jude has control of Cardin. Maddox says that they are allies for now, but the moment this wedding is over and Oak is safe, they will be enemies, real enemies. Jude hears someone crying at the party and she goes to investigate. She finds Heather hiding and also a cat. It's a charm that is easily undone, and Vivi fixes it and then erases Heather's memory. Jude is furious to learn that Vivi has been glamoring Heather in their relationship and that she's erased this memory, which is an incredibly important lesson if Heather is going to be safe in Elfheim. Taryn finally makes an appearance at her wedding, and she is wearing the earrings that Jude got her. Not to mention, Locke is walking with a limp. He and his bachelor party were the ones who tried to murder her last night. The Court of Shadows calls Jude away because Orla did not attack the wedding, she's attacked the prison. Jude goes to Bail Kinsel next. Not a surprise, he's not there. Orla has rescued him in the hopes that she can marry her daughter to Bailkin and make them king instead of Cardin. It'll be tough to do since we have the same problem we had in book one where either Oak or Cardin will have to crown Bailkin king, but maybe Orla has a plan for that as well. This is all too easy and too well set up and Jude finally discovers who betrayed her. It's Ghost, one of those members from the Court of Shadows. Jude is mad and sad and knocked unconscious. When she wakes up, she's at the bottom of the sea. Jude is being held captive in a prison cell when Nicasia comes and visits her to punch her and pester her and, yes, knocks her unconscious once again. Since Jude isn't wearing any charms or protections, everyone in the undersea assumes that Jude can be glamored, which means that Jude is going to have to be a very good actress to pull this off. Jude is questioned by Orla and then left to sit in the room. As a glamored human, she is not a threat, so she overhears what their plans are, the most significant of which is that Grimson is making a new crown, not a blood crown, which means that Balkin may not need a relative to crown him king of Elfheim. When Jude wakes up the next morning she's in withdrawal. All of those poisons she was eating to slowly inoculate herself against fairy magic have left her addicted. As she upped the dosages over the course of the month, she improved her immunity but also made everything so much worse now that she's not taking them. Left alone in her cell, Jude has quite a lot of time to think about Cardin and his relationship to Balkin and how he always thought he was unloved, as well as her relationship to Cardin and what might have changed if she had just told him how she felt. After several days, somebody finally comes for Jude. In that span of time, they have forgotten that humans need food and water to survive. If it was difficult before to act as though she was under their glamour for everything they asked of her, it's a lot harder now that she is dehydrated and starving. After they interrogate her, they glamour her into forgetting about their questioning. It doesn't hold, but neither do the glamours that tell her she feels full or that she's no longer thirsty. Jude is fixated on escaping, but knows she doesn't have the endurance to swim to the surface as hungry and tired as she is right now. She goes from long-term planning to just trying to survive hour by hour. Balkin finally comes to her cell and asks some significant questions, like why would somebody who lives only for pleasure like Cardin want to be the king of Elfheim? Jude has to think really fast, which is, you know, hard, and she says maybe he did it to spite his father. And Balkin thinks, yes, Cardin is probably petty enough for this to have been the reason, and he asks Jude whether or not not Jude would kill Cardin. Jude says yes, emphatically. Balkin orders Jude to kiss him. Gross. And it's like kissing a dead fish. Balkin tells Jude to kiss him the way she would kiss Cardin, and after it happens, he reveals that Cardin has asked for her back. Cardin has negotiated for her return to Elfheim, and that they're going back to the surface. Balkin's freedom was part of the price for Jude's release. He tells her to come find him at Hollow Hall whenever she can, because she is their spy inside the palace. Before she leaves, Jude 
Steve asks Balkin if he has the new crown yet, and Balkin admits that it's very nearly ready. He orders Jude to avoid all charms and enchantments so that she'll remain loyal to them. Jude wonders what else was in the price that Cardin paid for her ransom. Part of it was Balkin's freedom, and now he has been appointed ambassador to the Undersea, which is bad enough, but Jude doesn't know the rest of it yet. Out of the sea and loaded into a carriage, she finds just how weak she is. They take her directly to Maddox's estate, and she is essentially prisoner there. The guards are under orders not to let her into the palace. It's Taryn who tells Jude she was gone almost an entire month, and that the High King and Maddox formed a truce to get her back. Jude hears someone arrive and ask for her. It's an emissary from the Court of Termites, the same court who were the first ones to back Cardin when Jude crowned him king. Jude thinks they're there to call in their favor, and they are, but they also have news. Cardin let the Undersea attack the Court of Termites. Many people from their court have died, and without any promise of retaliation from Cardin, who was supposed to protect them. This was part of the price for getting Jude back. The emissary reminds Jude that she owes them a favor, and they want Prince Balekin dead. But Prince Balekin is the ambassador to the Undersea, and if he ends up dead, they will be at war. The Court of Termites says, then they should go to war. When Jude goes to the Court of Shadows to see if they can help her sneak into the palace, she sees it's been completely obliterated, presumably by ghost, before he left with Queen Orle. There's only one other person that Jude can think of to turn to since she can't get into the palace to see Cardin, and that's Prince Balekin. So she goes to Hollow Hall to look for him. He gives Jude a poison and tells her to kill Cardin at the upcoming masquerade ball. Jude sneaks into the palace and into Cardin's old rooms for a nap before using the passageway to sneak into the king's chambers. Jude covers his mouth so that he doesn't make any noise when he wakes up, and as soon as he realizes Jude is the one in bed with him, he pulls her on top of him. She tells him that Orla and Balekin have plotted his assassination and that she could have warned him sooner if he hadn't banned her from the palace. But Cardin has no idea what she's talking about, and she realizes Maddox has been working alone, and he has a lot more influence than she anticipated. Cardin says he knows Jude wants a reason for why he let the Court of Termites get attacked, and he says it's because it took Jude getting kidnapped before he realized what his real feelings for her were. Aww. He's been playing the cruel prince since that was all King Eldred thought he could ever be, and he's forgotten what real emotions feel like. Which is a cute excuse, I guess, but also, nah. While Jude was gone, Cardin says he tried to think of every order she would give him, and then he obeyed every one. A crossbow appears in the corner of Jude's vision. The Court of Shadows has arrived to rescue Cardin from Jude, and Jude finally has to reveal Dane's gaze. She tells them about Balekin's plan to murder Cardin, and points out if she was glamoured, she wouldn't be able to reveal any of this. At the masquerade ball, Jude tells Locke that she knows he tried to murder her during his bachelor party, and of course, she has plans to retaliate. Everyone keeps asking Jude where Cardin is, and it makes her a little nervous that she doesn't know. When he finally arrives, he is very drunk, or at least he seems to be. He pulls Jude onto the dance floor, and when he kisses her in front of everyone, she tastes wraithberry on his lips. He's not drunk, he's been poisoned. Balekin swoops in and announces this fact to the crowd, and then orders Jude to turn out her pockets. If she had been glamoured, of course, the vial of poison would have been revealed to everyone, and their plan would have been executed very neatly. But Jude isn't under his glamour. She tells everybody that Cardin is just drunk, which Cardin agrees to, and that Jude needs to remove him from the party. Back in his rooms, she tries to make Cardin drink as much water and eat as much food as he can to try to sop up some of the poison. It's just not enough. Balekin sends a message and says he has an antidote to the poison. He'll give it to Cardin in exchange for the crown. Jude leaves for the rendezvous saying she will get the antidote from him somehow. And she does. She tells Balekin that they're going to test whether or not the antidote works, and she takes the vial of poison he gave her and knocks it back. She takes half a dose of the antidote and spits it out into the empty vial she's now holding. It turns out the vial wasn't full of poison, she washed it out and filled it with water. So now she has half a dose of antidote in her possession, which should be more than enough to make sure that Cardin survives. Balekin is furious, and the two of them fight right there. Not quite regulated enough to be a duel, but by the end of it, Balekin dies on the end of Jude's knife. When Jude makes it back to Cardin, she discovers that Maddox had Taryn dress up as Jude and go visit him. Taryn, as Jude, requested that Maddox be allowed to take half the army as well as set free from his obligations to the crown. And Cardin said yes, because he trusts Jude and he had no reason to think this wasn't her. Later that night, with half the antidote in him, Cardin is feeling much better and he calls Jude back to his chambers. This submission for a year and a day thing 
isn't working. He did exactly what Taryn asked without question and gave up half of his power in the process. Cardin says that they need to trust each other, and he thinks that one of the ways they can do that is by getting married. Then she can give any royal decree she wants, and she won't have to order him around. She'll have real power of her own. Cardin also says they don't have to stay married. They can be married until Oak is on the throne, and then he'll set her free. Jude is reluctant, which is not the same as being suspicious, and with a little bit of coaxing, she agrees. They perform the ceremony right there in Cardin's rooms. And then Jude follows through on her promise, and she releases Cardin from his obedience to her. They trade kisses and go to bed, and Jude sleeps the best she can remember sleeping in a very long time. A servant comes in the morning to tell Cardin that his brother Brother Balkin was killed in a duel the night before, and Cardin knows immediately that Jude did it, and Jude didn't tell him. Well, that trust sure lasted long, didn't it? He is understandably distant as they ride to the shore to meet with the Queen of the Undersea. Queen Orla is furious that Balkin is dead. Orla knows it was Jude who killed him and demands justice. Queen Orla threatens war, and Cardin threatens to use his power over the land to remove her kingdom from her. And with that, he drags an island out of the sea and creates a whole new part of Elfheim. Cardin requests that Nicasia stays behind and acts as ambassador to the undersea, and Jude doesn't like that at all. Even if Cardin's entire seduction of Nicasia was on her say-so, she is still very jealous. And then Cardin says he must dispense justice to Jude, and he orders her exiled from Elfheim. And Jude, of course, is shocked and cold and furious. He can't do this to his high queen. But when she says that, all of the other fairies burst out laughing, and no one believes it. And Cardin is quiet. He doesn't deny it, but he lets everyone else speak for him when they say that it's ridiculous. Jude has been living in the mortal world for a month. Jude is moping on the couch and eating junk food and watching cartoons, and it's Vivi who tells Jude that she needs to get back at Cardin. And that's where we leave off with the Wicked King. The Queen of Nothing is coming out this November. We are all very excited. I hope this recap helped get you ready. I love this series, so even if you've been spoiled and haven't read the books yourselves, I hope you'll go and pick them up. Holly Black is one of my favorite authors, both because of her unique writing style and because she just has a fantastic personality. Her female characters are always so unapologetically ambitious, each in their own individual way, because there is no right way to be a strong female character. All of our links are down in the place with the thing. Remember, spoilers are always welcomed in the comments, and subscribe! Until we read again, I've been Emmy, and it's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>